Hi, everybody. Welcome to Lurking for Legends. We're a live video cast and a weekly show. <laughs> I'm screwing this up already. I've, uh, I I rewrote my introduction and I'm saying it the way I used to. So let's start again. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our live video cast. Lurking for Legends is a weekly show that talks with people from all walks of the publishing world. Christy Stratos, who can't be here tonight, David M. Kelly and myself encourage viewers to chime in with questions for our guests at any time or simply get involved by commenting on what you hear on the show. And tonight, uh, Lurking for Legends is excited to have, us, have with us rom-com and chick lit author Jennifer Lieberman. Welcome, Jennifer. Sorry about that rough introduction. It's all good. The, the you know, beauty of live shows and live theater. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, you know I'm a what? theater nerd. I, I come from the theater world, so you just roll yeah. with it. Yeah, Christy Stratos normally does our introductions, and she does it so smooth. I don't know if she has a teleprompter like the president of the U.S. does. Like it doesn't look like he's reading, but she does it so smooth. I'm not as smooth as she is. Uh, I try, but it's, it never works for me. But anyway, uh, before we get started, Jennifer, uh, can you just let our guests know a little bit about Jennifer, what she does, and uh, yeah. yeah, whatever else you want to tell us. So I'm an actor who started writing and producing to give myself acting work. And I recently, in the past few years, adapted my award-winning one-woman show into a novel. And that took me down a rabbit hole of a few other projects that we'll get into. And I now have two how-to books also, um, including um, one of them is a number one bestseller on Amazon, how to record and publish your audiobook in seven simple steps. Excellent. So actually, I mean, that's a, a topic that, uh, that kind of interests me quite a bit. So, I mean, in terms of this, I mean, you hear a lot of kind of mixed advice from people, you know, some say, you know, you should always kind of like, you know, get somebody professional to do the, the voice work for your audiobooks. You know, some people kind of like say, you know, it's like, oh, no, just do it yourself, you know, sort of thing. Um, and then you've got people like me who are terrified of, like, hearing their own voices and, they say, oh, my God, no way am I ever going to do that. So <laughs> it's like, yeah, have you got any kind of like good kind of like general tips for people? How, how would you go, you suggest people go about it? Yes, definitely. Thank you so much for asking. So during the OG lockdown of 2020, I knew my novel was going to be launching and a friend of mine suggested that it was the perfect time to record my own audiobook because I was locked at home and there was nothing to do. <laughs> um, you know, in terms of acting work, I had just mm -hmm. right before the pandemic, I had just finished an off-Broadway show where I had the privilege of playing Gilda Radner. And, um, you know, the theater was dead. Film sets were shut down. Nothing was happening. And I did, like I mentioned, I adapted my novel from my one-woman show. So I did play all the characters on stage. And I am a professional actor. So it was an easy decision and kind of like a natural progression for me to record my own audiobook. That being said, I messed up a lot. And when I say a lot, I mean, I recorded the entire book and then in the editing realized I needed to trash it all and start again from scratch. Ouch. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the same friend who encouraged me to record the audiobook when I told her my plight, she was like, oh, well, perfect. Now you can write a how-to book and help <laughs> other authors avoid making the same mistakes. So I'd like to address your first question, which has to do with hiring a professional. Not all of us, especially for indie writers and self-published authors, we don't have the luxury of hiring somebody. Um, you know, for me, I would have wanted to do it on my own anyway, because I'm a performer. But for other people, other people want to have an audiobook, but it costs thousands and thousands of dollars to have a professional record it as it should, because I've done it and it takes months um, because you can only record a certain amount a day. Mm -hmm. Your voice gets tired. It's not realistic mm -hmm. for us to record more than an hour, even if you're a professional. You know, um, even professional speakers, professional 
um, hosts, radio personalities, news anchors, things like that, they're never speaking for an hour straight uninterrupted. So, um, so yes, so it's very time consuming and I actually break down a very realistic timeline in the book. So that's number one. Number two, I address, we all hate our voice. We all hate looking at ourselves in the mirror and in pictures and on video. Like this is common. This is common across the board. Even professional actors, like I've seen Charlize Theron in, in interviews talk about how she never watches her work because she can't stand to look at herself. And she's like the most gorgeous woman in the world and one of the best actresses alive. So it's like if Charlize can't even like bear, you know, her own image, like we have no hope. So part of it is like, just get over it, get over yourself and do it anyway. And the book has a very kind of encouraging cheerleading tone um, because I address all of these issues. And I address the fact that you're going to make a lot of mistakes and that's okay. And I suggest to go watch some bloopers of your favorite show and you'll see how many mistakes the professionals make on a regular basis. So I, I'm very realistic. I manage people's expectations. And then in terms of um, vocal quality and vocal stamina, uh, the first thing I suggest in the book, chapter one is get in shape. Well, actually, chapter one is yes, you can. Sorry. <laughs> chapter one is yes, you can. <laughs> and basically, I'm talking everybody into it because we're so much better at talking ourselves out of things than talking ourselves into things. So and then chapter two is get in shape. You got to get your voice in shape. And I, as a professional actor, and I was just coming off of a stage show, I do vocal work every day anyways, because that's just part of going to the gym, you know, like I go to yoga class, I have to keep my body in shape. And I also have to keep my voice and my instrument in shape. So the first thing I suggest is for a month, a full month, and I give you a timeline and I give you exercises, you are going to be doing vocal exercises every single day for a month to build your vocal stamina. And you're going to start with five minutes a day, and you're going to build your way up to 30 minutes a day. And you are going to continue doing these vocal exercises every single day through the completion of recording your book. So it's a big commitment. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a huge like time commitment, but it's a commitment in terms of like it's a marathon and you have to chip away a little bit every single day in order to achieve what you're, you know, driving towards. Um, so all of these things are addressed and it's realistic and funnily enough one of my friends who was proofreading for me she's like this would scare me away like maybe you don't want to put all this stuff like the timeline and how long it's going to take and i'm like no that's exactly what i want to do because i want people to have a realistic idea of what they're biting off before they start because there's nothing more frustrating then starting something that you're not going to finish, or at least for me. Absolutely, yeah. So if you have a realistic gauge of, okay, what am, what what do I need to put into this? How much time a day? How many days? You know, and I break it down like by, you know, if your book is this many chapters, and because obviously you're not even going to be able to record an hour every single day. That's not realis realistic either. I talk about um, equipment and doing it cheap. Like I spent less than $100. And, um, you know, I don't know. I feel like I feel like I give a lot of good information and um, people can really learn from all the mistakes that I made. And, you know, so I did address all of the things that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Winded. <laughs> No, 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 not at all. Oh, and thank it, you. It's funny what you say, getting over yourself, because if David and I didn't uh, get over ourselves, uh, we certainly have faces for radio. And uh, I don't know about Dave, but uh, I cannot stand my own voice. So you, you're bang on mm -hmm. about that. And uh, it took me a bit. I, my, did, I scheduled myself for my first interview many years ago, and uh, I didn't sleep for a couple of nights. So I, right away, I canceled my interview. There's no way I can do that. And then I figured I have to have my author career. So I finally went ahead and did it. And I thought I absolutely sucked when I went on there, but uh, 
I did it. And that's the first step. But once you get over that first step, it doesn't make the second step much easier, but it makes it a little bit easier. And as authors, you know, especially for independently published authors, we need to get over ourselves as exactly bang on. And once we can, once you can do that, you can move on. You can't move on until you do that. So I've gotten over myself. I stumbled just like I did at the beginning today. And it doesn't bother me anymore. I'm not going to go to bed tonight and go, oh my God, I really screwed that up. Uh, it's, it's just part of the job. And I'm okay with it. I'm not a professional speaker. I never will be. So, But it, it's certainly true what you say about that. And it's interesting what you said about equipment, $100. I'm thinking as you're talking there, you know, do we need this big soundproof booth or these massive mics and stuff like that? And uh, I cocooned myself in a closet with comforters. I draped right. them over the um the rod and i like put a little table and a little chair in there and i had some water and i literally like just cocooned myself in a closet um you know and i suggest what closet is best and not to use a bathroom because it's very echoey and um i sound great singing in the bathroom though yeah everyone sounds great <laughs> that's the only place i sound good singing i yeah. don't <laughs> every day yeah. Yeah, so you know you can really do it a la cheap, and um, you know. And the other thing is, I that I address in the book is if you are passionate enough to write your story and publish a book, that's mm -hmm. a huge undertaking in itself. For sure. So your voice is probably the best voice to tell your story. And I know a lot. I've heard uh, readers love to hear the author tell their story. For sure. So we have a, one of our viewers, CJ Davidson, says, he says, sounds like a huge process. What platforms or platform do you use to record audio and have quality sound? I used Audacity. And I actually mm. talk about the software in the book. And I have some screenshots and diagrams showing how to use it. Um, Audacity is fabulous because also, like, they let me, you know, um, use their screenshots and I had to submit the book to them for approval, you know, but I, I used that and it made it very easy. And the other thing too, is you're going to stumble, you're going to mess up, take a breath, start the sentence again, start the paragraph again. Oh, and also um, I recommend you have to read the chapter out loud twice the day of before you go into the booth, because there's a rhythm you know, and sometimes mm -hmm. you'll like run out of breath on a long sentence mm -hmm. or sometimes you'll flub the punctuation or, you know, you're just just to have like the right tone and nuance. You can't go into it cold either, you know, and the more we practice wrapping our mouth and our tongue and our lips around the words, the easier they come. So on the day of recording, by the time you actually sit in the booth to do it, that's the third time you're doing it that day. Ideally, if you listen to my book, if you like listen to, <laughs> to, to like what I set out for you, right? you know, I'm sure. And if somebody does that, they're going to find their own little nuances that work a little bit better for them. But uh, you, you're giving them the, the basics to get in there and start doing it. And then they can hone it, I would imagine. Yeah, because you need to rehearse. Like, yeah, nobody, oh, for sure. You know, nobody's performing without a rehearsal. So. So Hillary Stokes is saying, hi, everyone. Uh, I wonder if vocal exercises can be helpful for presentation skills generally in terms of podcasts, et cetera. So I guess Dave and I better start doing these before we come on here. Yeah. I think Hillary's digging at me for my introduction is what she's doing. Yes, <laughs> Hillary, thank you so much for the question. And yes, actually, one of the reviews that I got for the book mentioned that the book would be very helpful for podcasters as well. Um, the mm -hmm. vocal exercises, the equipment, um, you know, even if you don't record your podcast live and you're going to edit it, Audacity is a great um, tool to record it in um, or even import your recording in order to edit it. So, yes, vocal exercises and they just help in general for presentation, whether it's public speaking or even just at meetings or pitching. Mm hmm. And we just got another one here from Wanda. So I love the fact that you keep it so real. Some people make it look and sound so easy. And then we try it and it's a mess. That's me. Is it, a <laughs> it is a breath of fresh air to hear people who are honest and real about the mm. process. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, in all honesty, like I failed the first time around, <laughs> like completely. <laughs> and um, 
you know, if we weren't in a lockdown, I don't know if I would have had like the energy to push myself to do it a second time. <laughs> but because of the circumstances and like out of work actor without any possibility of getting on stage. So, um, you know, it was actually exciting to me to know that, you know, I had a performance to do every week, a couple of days out of the week. I didn't record every day because some days my voice just needed a rest. Mm. Mm -hmm. So you you said you mentioned that you um, that you write you wrote your own screenplay or you were on show sure. um, and obviously as fiction authors we're kind of used to um, the editing process for novels and things like that so is it a similar process for a screenplay or is it more collaborative when you're kind of doing rehearsals or how does it all work? Yeah. Oh, that's such a great question. Thank you, David. So the process is different. The development process is quite different for a script. So I started off um, in theater. I was running a little theater company in the East Village um, in New York. And that's where I kind of learned the ropes of how to produce and how to do everything correctly. And script development was number one, because if you don't have a solid script, why put money into a production that's going to fail, you know, and because it's such a collaborative process and it's not just like, OK, I wrote my manuscript here, give it a read. It's like you have to hire actors and technicians and a whole team to do a workshop even of the production before it even gets picked up for a full run. There's like so many steps in the process. So generally with a script, whether it's a play or a screenplay, you know, it doesn't matter if it's going to be filmed or if it's going to be live. Step one is a table read. So basically you get a bunch of people around a table. They don't even need to be actors. And a lot of times I suggest that they're not actors because really good actors can make bad writing sound great. And if you just have like a group of friends who aren't performers read it, then you can really hear if the writing works, if the writing lands, if the jokes land. So step one would be a table read. Step two, or also, let me take a step back. I've also been part of writing groups where we bring our pages in. We meet once a week and everyone gets to bring five or 10 pages and we read them together like a table read around a table, but you only read sections of it instead of reading the whole thing before the whole thing is ready because that's another thing too a lot of people don't want to continue in the process if like the first scene is terrible <laughs> um so yeah so reading doing a table read and then from there we'll do a staged reading once again doesn't matter if it's for stage or screen you get a bunch of people in a room you have actors sitting on folding chairs holding the script in front of them and you invite an audience usually a friendly audience, an audience who's going to be constructive and supportive. You want a mix of people. You don't only want people in the industry because sometimes people in the industry can be um, maliciously critical. <laughs> so you also want a cross section because that's the other thing too. Like how many times, you know, do critics tear something apart, but it's like the biggest, you know, box office hit. Mm. So that's the other thing too. You have to kind of have a good mix of who you invite to make sure that, um, you know, just the regular Joe Schmo person, you know, if, and th that's your audience, the Joe Schmoes, you know, like the regular people are your audience. You know, the critics are like the the one percent. So their opinion is you you kind of have to take it with a grain of salt. Um, I don't mean to bash critics, but I mean, like, <laughs> but, but you know what I'm talking about, <laughs> you know, like. Um, it's funny because the friend of mine, um, you know, he's not in the industry at all. And he, he read one of my pieces and he's like, oh, this is really great. But what do I know? I'm not in the industry. And I'm like, no, you're the audience. You're the real audience. The industry <laughs> isn't the audience, you know? So that's another, so yes. So like then a table read and then 
from the table read, you know, the, uh, the stage reading, and it, it might go, it might flip flop, you know, because you might have a stage reading, get feedback, rewrite it, then do another table read before it's ready for an audience again. So yeah, there's a lot of process, but also because it's not being, the audience is not reading it, the audience is going to be hearing it and watching it, you really need to hear actors reading it. And I guess that's like the biggest difference. Once again, long winded. No, no, no. no it's you, uh, you know what you're talking about. So it's good to, to hear what's going on. I'm going to digress just a little bit because uh, when we send you our Google form and we ask you to fill things out for us, you uh, gave us a bit of your background and I'll just read a bit of it. Uh, I know it was in the, the Facebook post, but uh, you hold a Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy from New York University in Toronto. You've appeared in over 30 stage productions in Toronto, New York, City, Los Angeles, Europe, and Australia, including your award-winning solo show, Year of the Slut. And that, of course, just jumped right out at me. And uh, i just curious as to what that show is all about. And is, is this the, the solo show that you were talking about before? Yeah. And this is one, and I noticed, uh, which is now the bestseller on Amazon, called Year of the What? And I'm imagining that you changed the last word because Amazon was not happy with it? Yeah, I had to. I originally published it with the original title in 2018, and I couldn't get any ads approved. I kept Really? On, hey, wow. Yeah, on Amazon or all social media platforms. So by 2020, I resolved to relaunch, rebrand, change the title and give it a real shot. And I'm so happy that I have because I yeah. it went from being completely dead in the water right. to being a number one bestseller on Amazon. Um, and I won three awards for it now. On Friday, mm -hmm. I found out I won the gold medal at the Global Book Awards for the coming of age category. Oh, congratulations. So, Good Yes, and it's my same friend who convinced me to record the audiobook and then write the audiobook book. She was the one who convinced me to change the title. I'm going to give her a shout out. Her name's Stacy Demalski, and she has a company called The Memoir Midwife. So if um, you need some help birthing your book, she is the woman to go to. <laughs> oh, is that interesting? So she's a midwife, and my mind automatically went to she's a midwife, but she's a midwife with books. The memoir. Midwife. That's cool. Yes. So uh, she's become a great friend and a colleague of mine. And um, so she was the one because I struggled. She suggested that I change the title. And it was several months. I was like resistant for several months because yeah. I'm like, but the but the title is what made it so successful on stage. You know, like <laughs> I was competing with everything in New York City. I was competing mm -hmm. with Broadway and, you know, and people came to see my show because of the title, you know, and it's so funny how like the title that made it a hit on stage killed it in publishing. Mm -hmm. yeah, so um, it, I literally January 1st of 2020, I don't know if you guys have ever read Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. I reread it every few years. So December of 2019, I started rereading it and literally New Year's Day, I came across the chapter that talked about a guy whose book was a complete failure and then he changed the title and it became this huge success. And I was like, okay, universe, I hear you. Okay, okay, I get it, I get it. <laughs> and that was the day I was like, fine, fine. I don't want to, but I'll do it. Because <laughs> I wanted to be, I didn't, you know, they, there's that saying, you could be right or you could be happy. I want to yes. be happy. Yes, I think so. No, it's so true. I want to be happy. And you know what? I'm <laughs> pretty happy. <laughs> that is so true. My failure is a success. Yay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so that so oh, so the one woman show, it was like just a, a coming of age comedy loosely based on my life. And I never thought I would do a one woman show. Everything that's led me to success is 
doing things I never thought or wanted to do. <laughs> but I, I got to LA and somebody was like, nobody knows who you are. Write yourself a showcase piece. You're a great writer. You're a great actress. Do a one woman show because they cost a lot less than making movies. And you're only one actor. You don't have to rely on other people or pay anybody. And you can rehearse in your living room all by yourself. So <laughs> I, I could just imagine all that, you know, even if you're comfortable on stage with a bunch of other people, if you're doing that by yourself, like, you know, get over yourself is it certainly uh, comes to mind, like oh, you said yeah. earlier, but uh, it must have been very daunting getting up there the first time or two, mm -hmm. uh, wondering is, you know, are you going to hear crickets or, you know, you're going to get the hook or are people going to throw tomatoes at you, you know, whatever right. you, you envision. You know, it's funny because by the time it got to stage, I was actually pretty confident about oh, yeah. it. Okay. It was it was beginning the process. Um, and I had produced when I first got to L.A., I was in an acting class, as actors do. And I produced a one woman show for one of the women in my acting class. She was rehearsing pieces of her show in class. Um, and she was phenomenal. And I was just like, oh, my God, you're like, this is great. Like. I'm like, I'm new to LA, I have no connections here, but I did produce theater in New York for a few years. Like I'll help you with this show just because I think you're phenomenal and I believe in it. And I helped her, hers was called Latina on the Loose and she won, she, hers, it got picked up and she won several awards and it was phenomenal. And then another woman from the same acting class was doing her one woman show called Mommified and she hired me to help her with her show. And I was the associate producer. And watching both of these women, I knew like I would never do a one woman show. I was like, I was like, I'm a good actress, but I'm not that kind of actress. I'm not that kind of, you know, I can't like play 10 characters and snap in and out and la 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 la. Well, you know what? You don't know what you can do until you try. <laughs> So I, um, so it wasn't until like, I had been in LA over a year, I met a woman, her husband owned a literary agency. And she's like, write yourself a one woman show, do it as a showcase, invite industry, let people know you exist. So I did. And when I started, I was just like, like, what am I going to do? And I actually, she brainstormed some ideas with me and everything I suggested. She was like, no, it's too artsy. You're not in New York. You're not in New York. This is LA. It has to be commercial. It has to be fun. It has to be sellable. It has to be, you know, and then I was just like, well, I always kind of like joked to myself that like, you know, when I was like 60, I'd write a book called Year of the Slut about like my first year after my first heartbreak, after getting out of my first real relationship. And she's like, that's great. Love the title. It's catchy. It's this. Like, that's your show. That's the one you have to do. And th literally, because she told me to, that's why I did it. Like, <laughs> It wasn't, you know, I had four other screenplays I had already written, you know, that I was like movies that I wanted to make. I, But movies cost so much more money than, you know, mm -hmm. renting a theater <laughs> for two nights <laughs> all by yourself without, you know, really needing to pay. No, I did. I hired a director and, of course, lighting technician and, and things like that. But it was like minuscule, you know, compared to a budget for a feature film. So... I started working on it and writing it and I was actually like floored that it just started writing itself. And like, as I'm writing for characters, the characters would like start coming out of me, you know, and I'd start like talking like them and moving like them. And it just like seamlessly came together. And that's kind of how it happened, you know, um, but I, when I began, I was like, I'm not good enough to do this. Like, I'm so not, this is not in my wheelhouse. And then guess what? It is. And then I was even hired to do somebody else's hmm. woman show in Australia. <laughs> well, that's awesome. So you say, did COVID derail this for you then at finally at the end? Or did you just at some point decide that you had okay. enough? No, I did the show. I did it in LA. I got into a festival in New York. I won an award. Someone suggested to write a novel. So I did. But no, I've, I've, I just, I, 
I felt like, okay, been there, done that, ready for the next thing. Like I wasn't trying to take this show all over the world. I was just trying to get an agent, you know, like in Lava mm -hmm. Land with Emma Stone. Mm -hmm. And I, I had more than like one person in the audience. I had friends from acting class and my mom came from Canada, but nobody in the industry like came, like nobody that mm -hmm. I actually did it for came, but I learned a lot and you know and i and i like feel like i hit that next level in my career right. it's like okay now i'm at this level now i you know i can achieve this and then um and then after that i did like a web series with a friend and then i made a couple of my short films and you know just other things other things so you mentioned earlier um gildu adna and uh, I noticed you um, that you worked on the play with a little help. Um, it's John Belushi, who happens yeah. to be one of my favorite comedians. So oh. could you maybe tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Um, so I, I was so fortunate. A very good friend and colleague of mine in LA, his name's Levi Lee Simon, one of the most prolific playwrights of our time, just have to let everybody know that. Like, I, I feel like, you know, I learned Tennessee Williams in school. I feel like in a generation or two, they're gonna be studying him. Like mm -hmm. he's that prolific, like he's phenomenal. Um, he was directing this play. He got hired to direct this play in New York and just literally gave me a call and said, hey, you wanna come do this? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> So I doubled, I, I played Judy Belushi and Gilda Radner, Judy Belushi mm -hmm. in the first half of the show, Gilda Radner in the second half of the show. And it was a phenomenal experience, very daunting. Like it was actually more scary, scarier <laughs> to play Gilda than to do a one woman show because that is a big, that's like a tall order. Those mm. are some big shoes to fill and to do it in the East Village in New York. It's not like doing it in like Sudbury. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like everybody in New York has a point of view about Gilda. And I got an education too because um, Belushi was the one who discovered her. Everybody thinks Lauren Michaels discovered her. But Lauren mm. Michaels poached her from John Belushi's National Lampoon show. <laughs> he actually, Lauren Michaels actually poached half the cast of that show, including Chevy Chase. And um, mm. yeah, it, you know, it was pretty crazy. So, but it was, it was phenomenal. It was a phenomenal show. Um, Jack Zulo wrote it, produced it. He played John. He is phenomenally talented, musically talented. They did all, they did a lot of musical interludes because John was a musician as well. Jack is hilarious. Yeah. He has the depth to do the dramatic work. And I just feel so blessed. I also just met so many phenomenally talented actors getting to work on that piece. And um, the, the show was nominated for best, um, new musical off broadway by broadwayworld.com i was nominated for best performance off broadway along with jack and one of the other performers Artie brennan um so yeah it was just it was such a magical magical experience i um, bet and i imagine doing that is giving you so much more confidence going ahead like it's like it's like getting over ourselves like i did that first interview and uh you know, I, all of a sudden I figure, well, I can do another interview and now I do this show and, you know, I've gotten over myself. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, like it definitely was challenging. It was definitely work. And, you know, I worked with a dialect, like, cause Judy had a Chicago accent. I worked with a dialect coach. Like I, you know, I sought help. Like I wanted to make it as authentic as possible. I read a lot like Judy has an autobiography. I read her whole autobiography. I watched every bit of Gilda Radner I can get my hands on um, in terms of her interviews. You know, I've watched a, I've watched a lot of her movies just because I was a fan of hers growing up. Um, and but, you know, watching her in the interviews and her nuance and how she speaks and and all of that. So doing quite a bit of research for both roles 
Um, you know, and of course, like I always felt like there's never enough time. It's like, you know, I could, even if I had a year to prepare for Gilda, I don't think I ever would have felt ready for her. Judy's different because she's not a huge public figure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, most people don't even know what Judy Belushi looks like. So they're not going to know, like, if mm -hmm. I'm doing the accent right or if I'm doing her mannerisms correctly. But for Gilda, it was a whole other ball game. For sure. And did you ever confuse the two while you were? I, I was right? thinking the same thing. <laughs> no, no, not no. at all. Like they're they're so different, and the mm. you know, and also with the rehearsal process, you know, mm. the luxury that we have on stage is we actually get to go through a proper several week rehearsal process of, you know. Mm getting everything pretty tight. But, you know, for Gilda, I had to like wear a wig and have a very specific, you know, the overalls and, you know, the costume. So no, like as soon as I put the wig on and the costume, like I went into Gilda mode. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't hard to do. And I also see that you did vocals on a Spinal Tap album. <laughs> yes, I but have. You're not, but you're not a singer. I'm not, I ha it's like such a random claim to fame. <laughs> Did you turn it up to 11? Yes. Um, <laughs> so what happened was a um, friend of mine is, uh, is a music producer and composer. And he did the score for both of my short films and my web series and actually my one woman show, CJ Vanston. He's phenomenally talented. And he's a Grammy and Academy nominated musician. He produced the Spinal Tap albums. And one day I show up at his studio. We're about to start working on the score for one of my projects. And he's like, Jen, you can do a British accent, right? And I was like, yeah. He's like, do you mind just laying down a scratch track um, for the song I'm doing for Harry's new album, Harry Shearer's doing uh, his own solo album as Derek Smalls. So um, I was like, sure, why not? You know, it was just a scratch, like it was just a placeholder. He just needed like a female British voice to say a few lines in British. It was for a song called MRI, you know, because Derek Smalls is now like an old geriatric man and going through health issues and has to take his MRI, you know? So my vocals were like the nurse just saying like, don't move, <laughs> you can't wear your metal, you know, just like those types of things in the song. And it was probably two years later that I got a call from my friend CJ and he's like, oh, by the way, um, Harry's going to use your vocal. <laughs> See, like he's not going to get another, you know, another artist to do them. He thought your British accent was great. He actually asked if you were British. He's married to a British woman, number one. And number two, he is the best voice actor alive. Mm. And uh, 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 <laughs> so that was like a huge, um, a huge vote of confidence for me. Totally. And then I got to be in the music video as well. And I met Harry. I was actually sitting in the makeup chair when he walked by and he was like, great British accent. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry, I'm not sure if you mentioned the song name. What is the song name? I want to Google it. M-R-I. What's that? M-R-I. M-R-I by Spinal Tap. Okay, that's awesome. M-R-I, M-R-I. I will have to look that up. <laughs> Yeah, heavy metal version of a man going through an MRI. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. Sounds interesting. interesting because, um, I mean, I'm originally British, so, um, and you kind of like hear a lot of people doing, trying to do British accents and failing terribly. Uh, so that is like really quite an achievement, you know, sort of thing. Um, thank you. So, well, yeah, thank God it's it was like, just too long. Especially, <laughs> especially for the spinal tap. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure if it was like more than two lines, I wouldn't, you know, without any, because also it, it's not like I was rehearsed. I literally just walked in. Right. And my friend's like, oh, can you do this, you know, for like, you know, three seconds just before we start your session? And I was like, yeah, why not? Fun. <laughs> it's like, Harry might get to hear my voice. Yay. 
<laughs> <laughs> and then I got to work with Harry. And then there was like a live concert in LA. And like I they played the music video during the song. So like I'm on the Megatron and there's like Jack Black and Tenacious D on stage and like oh. Steve Lukather and Steve Vai and all these like musical legends. And I like took a picture because like they're on stage and then there's like my face on the on the video screen. And I'm just like, this is so surreal. Like mm -hmm. how is like who? What? Me? <laughs> that would be for sure. Yeah, it was so much fun. It was such a fun little random thing I got to do. Yeah. So I, I see we're getting to the end of our show. You know, it's just seemed to fly by. You, you mm -hmm. uh, wanted to touch on a couple of things before we left. And uh, oh, CJ says that uh, must have been a great experience. Uh, yeah. So you want to speak a little bit about your North African roots? Yeah. Oh, so yes, <laughs> I do stand up comedy. One of the other things never thought I would do, never thought I'd be good at, but you know what? Everybody out there, go do a bunch of stuff you thought you would suck at, because I guarantee you 50% of it, you're going to be phenomenal. You know, you just have to get over yourself. <laughs> so yes, um, it's so unexpected. Like people look at me and they would never expect, but I am half African. My mom is from Tunisia, North Africa, and I have a very strong connection to like my North African roots, my Tunisian like traditions and heritage. And um, I very much look forward to going to Tunisia and to seeing where my mother is from. And my grandfather's family is from an island called Jerba. And that's like top of my bucket list that I really need to see because our lineage dates back there 2,600 years. Wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah. And the other thing you wanted to touch on was uh, you've worked with the infamous Tommy, I'm going to screw his name up, Wiseau? Tommy Wiseau. Wiseau, yeah. sorry, I screwed that up, yeah. It's okay. Um, so I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with a movie called The Disaster Artist. It was starring James Franco and James Franco played Tommy Wiseau. Tommy Wiseau made the worst movie ever. It's called <laughs> The Room. Not Room, not the Academy Award winning one and about, about an abused woman. Called, it's The Room, a terrible romantic melodrama. It's so bad that it has a cult following of millions of people globally. That's awesome. And it screens prior to the pandemic, it was screening the last Saturday night of every month in over 30 different cities worldwide, including the, including in um, Leicester Square. I think it's the Prince, the Prince Charles Theater is, um, it screens in London, screens in Australia, it screens all over Canada, all over the US. And yes, so I had the privilege of working um, on Tommy's sitcom. It's called The Neighbors. And we got picked up on Hulu, but now it's not on Hulu. I think it's available. Like you can buy the DVD set on it or yeah, the DVDs. Do people even buy DVDs? I don't even know where you can stream it, but um <laughs> But that was like such a trip also, because he's such like an infamous, interesting, weird character. But I have to give him all the credit in the world because he created a multi-million dollar empire out of what was deemed the worst movie ever. Isn't that funny, eh? Mm -hmm. That is awesome. So... What's next for Jennifer Lieberman? Uh, it, is another book coming out? Uh, you know, show you're going to start in now that COVID's uh, kind of relaxing up here in Canada. What's When can we see Jennifer out on the streets again? So there are a few things on the go. Year of the what is the novel. It's year of the slut, really. But um, I've decided that it's actually a series now. So book two, Year of the Bitch, is in the works. <laughs> It's all going to be under the year of the what umbrella. And um, basically, I'm taking words that are used as weapons against women when we're young. If somebody wants to attack us, they call us a slut. As we get a little more mature and assertive, we're called a bitch. Um, 
So yeah, so Year of the Bitch is in the works, but it's just going to be called Book Two of Year of the What because I'm going to have the same problems with censorship. <laughs> but as soon as you open the front cover, it'll say, you'll know, you'll know what it is. <laughs> and um, I am also in the process of getting my feature film off the ground. So that is going to be my next project. Um, I have a feature film, it's called Longing, and it is a dramatic romance. Um, and uh, I'm very excited about it. It's um, It's been compared to the movie Closer, if you've ever seen that movie with um, Jude Law and Julia Roberts, Natalie Portman, Clive Owen. So it's, but this one's about four couples um, that are all kind of entangled, very tumultuous, and I'm very excited about it. So I'm gearing up to direct my first feature film that I wrote. Awesome. Yeah. And, and where can people find yourself? Obviously, they're on Amazon because you had to change your name on Amazon. Uh, so if they're looking for ebooks, are you wide? Or are you exclusive with Amazon? Then where else can we find your stuff? Um, yeah, I'm not exclusive with Amazon anymore. So, well, I, I guess for ebooks, are you okay, you? Kindle Unlimited? Yeah. In all honesty, I don't remember. I right. think I, I don't remember if I, because I just switched over to Ingram Spark. So I'm in the process of kind of revamping. But mm -hmm. yes, um, uh, the, go to Amazon for the ebook. Right. Um, I have the audiobook also available. I have the hard copies. They should be available everywhere books are sold. Um, and if you go to my website, jenniferlibermanactor.com, it'll link to everything on there. So you, there's a pay, there's a, a tab for books. Just go to books and you'll be able to find them there. And if you'd like to stay tuned with my adventures on social media, my handles are I am Jen Lieberman. Same one on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter makes it easy. Awesome. I think well, I'll have you. to pick up pick up the uh, book on the um, the voice stuff because I really feel like I could do with the help. So <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, definitely. And um, you know, I I do. I think it's a pretty good. I I have all the vocal exercises in there. So mm -hmm. I, you know what I mean. It's like a one stop shop in terms of resources. Like I don't expect you to go and Google like articulation exercises and breathing exercises and things like that. I put them all in the book to make it really accessible for everybody. No, and that's probably something we should do. I, I know when I played sports, I was always the one who never uh, stretched. I never thought I had to, but uh, as I'm getting older now, I'm thinking maybe I should have done that when I was younger and I wouldn't be as sore as I am some days. So it definitely, it, you know, it's good advice. I think a lot of us get too lazy to do these things. And I think if we cut corners, uh, we're just uh, hurting ourselves in the long run. So that's great advice. So thank you again for coming on, uh, Jennifer. We appreciate you being here. And if you ever want to come back on again, just uh, shoot us a line and uh, we'll hook you back up through Calendly and we'll get you back on to speak with, speak about whatever else is coming on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. I mean, Richard. It's okay. <laughs> no, there was a pop-up covering your name. I, <laughs> I was just your last name. David, David thank you, Richard, and thank you, David. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, Dave does that on purpose, yeah, just to throw you off. It's been, it's been such a pleasure chatting with you both, and I would love to come back, so we'll make it happen. No, oh, that's yeah, awesome. And it, that would be great. From the comments we've got, it seems like everyone enjoyed hearing you, so that's awesome. Excellent. And, so, Dave, uh, before we leave, is there anything new in the David Kelly universe? Uh, there is. I have finished the final round of editing on uh, my second Logan's World book. And there's, uh, so that's but there's something more important. So, uh, more importantly, I've started doing the formatting to put it into print and ebooks. But no. even more important than that, I finally got the door to my garage. There you go. <laughs> It's only taken four months. <laughs> awesome. Wow. I just saw pictures on social media today. I thought it was great. Dave finally got the door to his garage. That's that's awesome. Congratulations. So. Just Thank in you. time for spring. Yes. Mm. <laughs> and of course today it you know it's like so I've got to take my car out to so that he can actually put the door in, you know, and and, and assemble it and everything. Um and so of course it snows. Yeah, Dave's in Sudbury, so it's it snows quite regularly up in Sudbury, yeah. Yeah. 
So it yeah. snows. So there's me sort of driving out my Corvette in the snow. <laughs> With these great big slicks on it. Yeah, that would be yeah. That's awesome. Okay. I got it out the got it down the drive and then I was I was gonna put it in our temporary garage, our canvas garage, just to keep it kind of like dry and everything. And it's like I could reverse, but I couldn't go forward. Mm. There's just no, no traction at all. Mm -hmm. wow. And uh, so I ended up I had to just leave it out in the snow. <laughs> and then when I had to then when I got it back in, it's like then I had to of course dry it all. <laughs> it's like <laughs> don't leave it. <laughs> no, that's awesome. But yeah, that's my big news. <laughs> okay, awesome. So nothing new with me, uh, other than I'm still working on Windwalker, book three and a high cliff guardians. I'm about 111,000 words into it now. Uh, we're starting to wrap it up. So hopefully we can get that done uh, by the end of this month or beginning of next. And uh, yeah, that's it for me. And oh, there, I have a, a special announcement to make for myself, but I can't say it quite yet because it's not official. So I'll just leave that. Uh, I'll just let that hang and you guys can just mull that over. But uh, there's a big thing coming uh, in Ontario, actually, and we're all from Ontario. So it's, it's quite an announcement uh, when it actually does happen. So I think it's in the works. Anyway, so next week's guest will be Paranormal Romance and Fantasy USA bestselling author Anna Applegate. Anna lives tucked away in rural Maryland with her beautiful daughters, building a mini Disney princess army in their own little happily ever after. Anna is an avid reader, especially if it involves vampires. She loves to escape into her fictional world, whether through her unchecked book addiction or by creating her own paranormal romances filled with fantasy and surprise twists and turns. But before we go, I do have a very special announcement. I was just before we came online, I found out that one of the original hosts of Lurking for Legends will be returning to our show. Don't miss the return of Christy Stratos on Tuesday, May 24th, Tuesday. Christy's oh, going to make her return to Looking for Legends. So we look uh, forward to bringing her back and welcoming her back into our fold because she uh, she adds a lot to the show that Dave and I cannot. <laughs> so uh, from that point on, we're going to have three guests uh, or three co-hosts uh, harrying our guests. So you missed this one uh, this time, Jennifer. But uh, if you come back, we'll have Christy uh, grill you as well. So Oh, that sounds like fun. I can't yeah. wait. <laughs> No, no, the Christie's great. So, and hopefully, I'll get her to do the intros again. So, they'll be nice and smooth. <laughs> <laughs> so, today's show, I think we'll call uh, Getting Over Ourselves. And I, I think uh, we're doing that very well. So, for David M. Kelly, Christy Stratos, and myself, uh, we hope you all have a safe and productive week ahead. Until we meet again, take good care. Good night.